Everybody loves video games. Babies, astronauts, far left French presidential politicians looking to use the medium to express their beliefs about late capitalism and the necessary redistribution of wealth. European politics are not a hot topic on this channel, unless they belong to a black metal musician, so under normal circumstances, a French presidential election wouldn't be a logical jumping off point for a This Exists episode. But these are not normal circumstances. Could this be a potential game changer for markets and for politics in Europe? I think the French election right now, along with Donald Trump, is uh, the biggest uh, political um, story in the world. Following the disruptive Brexit referendum and the swamp draining election of Donald Trump in America, the French presidential election has been attracting an intense level of international attention. Voters were rejecting entrenched political parties and establishment politicians in favor of servicing fresh new faces on the left and right who were using new techniques to get their attention. Most notably, Marine Le Pen with her homespun racist nationalism, and on the far left, Jean-Luc Mélenchon with the most literal video game imaginable. <laughs> Fiscal Combat is a web-based game developed by Mélenchon's avid online fan base. He's basically 2008 Obama with a 2016 Bernie platform in which the candidate shakes down rival politicians and IMF members for money. The game, which is super fun and playable and built for virality, was the perfect way to express a key pillar of Mélenchon's platform, which involved a 100% tax on anyone earning 20% more than France's average income. But you've watched enough this exists to know that this was not the very first political video game. Not by 36 years. President-elect was a turn-based strategy game, considered to be the first political strategy game when it was released in 1981. This non-stop rock'em sock'em thrill ride gave hardcore adrenaline junkies the chance to run a campaign for Walter Mondale or Richard Nixon. I actually forgot that I had this gameplay video running in the background while writing this episode, and the total silence followed by the sound of Nixon winning very much spooked me. But while President-elect featured real politicians, it wasn't endorsed by them. Nixon wasn't in the mix at Strategic Simulations, the creator of that game, ensuring that the gameplay expressed key narratives of his campaign. That ambitious first actually belongs to Howard Dean. <laughs> it's hard to believe it today, but that unremarkable, albeit a little goofy moment, actually derailed an entire presidential campaign. And it's especially hard to believe that when you imagine the groundswell of support that Dean had built up thanks to his pioneering video game, the Howard Dean for Iowa game. And then we're going to Washington, D.C. to take back the White House! Yeah! I honestly was so excited that the Wayback Machine had an archive of the Howard Dean for Iowa game, and I let it hang there and load until I eventually realized that they probably had not also archived all of the video game files on a server somewhere in San Francisco, but I'm still waiting. Launched right around Christmas in 2003, the Howard Dean for Iowa game was half a campaign simulation with three mini games like pamphleting and half an instant messaging tool designed to help get out the vote in an early and crucial state. This was a hand-drawn, animated, and colored flash game that very genuinely, perhaps very too genuinely, expressed the reality of Dean's ground game. While that unnecessarily infamous yell would keep Dean from clinching the nomination, the game was indicative of a variety of new techniques being pioneered by his team to get out the vote. Techniques we'd take for granted today, like email lists and decent website. It would be 2008 before they were perfected by the dude Barry Obama, but before then, we would get John Kerry, Tax Invaders. In 2004, George W. Bush would defeat John Kerry, presumably all because of this flash game in which tiny George Bush heads shoot lasers at numbers that just say 658 billion. It lacks the envelope stuffing realism of the Howard Dean for Iowa game, but on the flip side, Bush did get to be president. 
And the GOP followed the same blueprint four years later when they released the strikingly similar Pork Invaders. Here's the opening screen of Pork Invaders, and as you can see, a pig is worth 10 points, a pig is worth 20 points, a pig is worth 30 points, and a pork barrel is the equivalent of a mystery box. I am 99% sure this is the only reason why John McCain never got to be president. Well, as you might guess, the game is pretty much like Space Invaders, but instead of spaceships, you have pigs. Instead of missiles, you're shooting the veto. And instead of points, you're racking up millions in saved taxpayer dollars. While Republicans might have picked up some gaming tips from Howard Dean, there was also an upstart independent senator from Vermont taking notes, unleashing the Bernie Arcade during his 2006 re-election bid. Disastrous. Absolutely abysmal. Featuring Bernie Sanders in an antique biplane, collecting facts while avoiding money, mudslinging, and fat cats. Disastrous. The good news is, and there is some good news out there, that is an unbelievable number. What a lovable nerd. But it's somewhat surprising that while Bernie and Bush were jacking Dean's gamer stees, Obama was just letting others do the work for him. Advertising inside video games is a growing business, but imagine the surprise of gamers across the nation when political ads like these started appearing on TV screens. In 2008, the Obama team bought ads in crucial swing states, including Florida and North Carolina, inside of 18 different EA games, including the Need for Speed and Burnout Paradise. The strategy must have worked well enough because he won both of those states and he repeated the same thing in 2012 when he became president again. I mean, it's kind of cool, but our prime minister actually codes his own games. You pose dog. Canada's spookiest magician, Justin Trudeau, tweeted about a game that he himself coded in December 2016. It looks cute enough, but if you spend a few minutes with it, you actually realize it's a total disaster, just like the federal liberal party. hey -o! Games as part of a youth outreach strategy are now an expected extension of any modern campaign. But for every fiscal combat, a naturally viral hit that plays off a candidate's platform and personality in an authentic way, you get Mission Majority. Join GOP for the Mission Majority. Find the keys to help Republicans win back the Senate. Four treacherous levels through the path to victory while dodging everything the Democrats can throw at us. Whoa, watch out. Unsurprisingly, very few wanted to join the lovable GOP elephant GOP on that particular mission, maybe because respecting taxpayers doesn't make for especially frenetic gameplay compared to shaking down the wealthy. Conservative politicians are better suited for unlicensed killing sprees. The extremely unlicensed Reagan Gorbachev is just the latest in a series of video games that play off the likeness of your friend and mine, Gorby. For some reason. Gorby's Pipeline was released by Compile in Japan in 1991. It's a Tetris-style game that challenges players to, spoiler alert, build a pipeline between the Soviet Union and Japan. Various online sources do claim that this was a propaganda tool approved by Gorbachev himself in order to strengthen Soviet-Japanese relations, but I cannot in good faith pass on that all too delightful to be real and not confirmed whatsoever factoid. What I can pass on is the delightful and very real Sega's Ganbar Gorby. Either the Japanese loved Gorbachev so much that two different developers put him in two different games in one year, or the Soviets were actually as good at gamer propaganda as contemporary French socialists. One way or another, the Soviet Union dissolved a few months after the release of these games, so maybe they were actually weapons. I know I feel threatened. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
it's fairly obvious that video games on their own do not win elections or topple governments. Mélenchon didn't survive the first round of the French presidential elections despite the success of his side-scrolling shakedowner. But these games are undoubtedly an interesting and indelible part of today's strategic political landscape, accentuating a politician's policy positions and their ability to credibly relate to a prized youth voting bloc. It's easy to veer very quickly into fellow kids' territory, but if you're lucky, maybe a smug Canadian will make a video on the internet about just how smart you are. What do you think? Can video games help politicians connect with the youths? What type of game, what format of game would you like to see a politician ape next? Let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe for new episodes of This Exists. Be excellent to each other.